Good morning and welcome to the State Election Leaders Forum on the Environment. I'm Lisa McCaskill and it's my pleasure to be the chair of today's forum. Welcome to our party leaders, Premier Jay Weatherall, Stephen Marshall, leader of the Liberal Party, Nick Xenophon, SA Best and Mark Parnell, leader of the Greens. Welcome also to Tammy Franks, MLC and David Spears. And welcome to all of you that are here today with us in person and also to those of you joining us via the live streaming. Today's Leaders Forum is hosted by Conservation Council of South Australia, the Wilderness Society, Solar Citizens and Australian Conservation Foundation on behalf of a sector-wide coalition of 33 climate and nature groups across South Australia who collectively have a direct reach of 130,000 South Australians who care deeply about our environment. This event is the major set piece opportunity for the political parties to address the key environmental challenges and opportunities that will determine the future of South Australia. To begin, I'd like to invite Bonnie Brody, Ghana woman from Port Adelaide, to share with us the welcome to country. Please welcome Bonnie. Namani, Nainari, Bonnie Brody, Nai Wakandi, Namani, Nabudni, Ghana Miana. Hello everyone, my name is Bonnie Brody and I welcome you all on Ghana land. My grandmother, Veronica Brody, was a great activist for her community and the environment. I think in the present time we have lost the passion and the fight to care for our environment. Being Aboriginal, my people have a strong connection to the land. The thing we are taught is that we don't own the land, but the land owns us. We have to learn again how to love and protect the land, not only for ourselves, but the future upcoming generations. So I hope today there will be honest questions that are heard and answers that are answered with nothing less than respect, honesty and care. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. And also welcome to Sarah Hanson-Young, who has just arrived. Now, uh, how the forum will run, we will have an opening statement from each of the leaders, and it's four minutes, and I will be timing you because we've got a lot to get through today. Um, then there's been a huge amount of community interest in the environmental policy platform South Australia, Our Future document that was released uh, late last year, and it was sent to all the major parties. So questions today will focus on the top ten issues from the platform. Now, some responses have already been received, but the forum hopes to clarify each party's policy and will re result in a final report card, if you like, or environmental scorecard that will be finalised in the next few days. And the responses, with the responses that have been received to date, plus the outcome of today's forum, um, and then they will be communicated directly with members and supporters. So we have a lot to get through, so I'll be reading out most of those questions, apart from a couple that will be coming from the floor. We'll be covering things like nature protection, oil drilling in the Great Australian Bight, renewable energy, marine parks and nuclear waste dumps, just to name a few. But firstly, for the opening statements from the leaders. Now this order has been randomly selected. I put the names in a bowl last night and had my son choose them with the dog adjudicating. Um, and they came out this way. So first up, I'd like to invite Jay Weatherall, leader of the Labor Party, followed by Stephen Marshall. So you may as well all come up here and sit next to each other up here. Nick Xenophon from SA Best and Mark Parnell from the Greens. So if you can take your positions on the chairs, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, so you're first, Jay, and your time starts now. Do you want to do it from your chair or do you oh, want to do it from, we'll here? Do it from here? Where, where okay. would you like to go from? No, no, it's fine. This okay. is fine, yeah. All right. Uh, well, look, thank you so much. And to all of my colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, can I also thank you for that beautiful welcome to country. I knew your grandmother. She was a beautiful woman and uh, such a great leader. Um, the single biggest environmental challenge facing our state, and uh, the nation, the world, uh, is action on climate change. And I'm proud to say that this state government uh, is a leader, not just in the nation, but in the world. We've taken a leadership role. We're international co-chairs of the Climate Group, which is a combination of states and regions around the world that comes together for action on climate change. We played an important role in Paris, bringing together states and regions to ginger up 
uh, international actors to make sure they are The truth is that most of the action on climate change occurs in regions and cities. That's where all the movement is. That's where we can take incredibly important steps. We've signed up to the under two MOU, the important commitment to make sure we don't get dangerous global warming. We're the first jurisdiction in Australia to adopt a zero emissions target by 2050. We're developing an international, we have developed an internationally recognised climate change adaption framework, which has been acknowledged and celebrated in international forums. And we're making Adelaide the world's first carbon neutral city in partnership uh, with the Adelaide City Council. This state, before we came into government, uh, had uh, basically 99% of its electricity provided by fossil fuels. Now it's 48.9%, an extraordinary achievement over the period of our time in office. These measures bolster our international cooperation. That's why people like Elon Musk come here to partner with us, because as he said, we took a risk and he wanted to take a risk in partnering with us to make sure that we're successful. And when he did that, the world saw what we did. Every major news outlet around the world saw South Australia's leadership in renewable energy. It went around the whole world. Uh, and this is sending a message to the world that we're prepared to step up. The wonderful thing about Paris last time we went there is there was a shift really from the idea of uh, action on climate change being a challenge to being an opportunity. People could now see that this is also an economic opportunity. So the world's largest lithium-ion battery, the world's largest state-owned, uh, the world's largest solar thermal plant of its kind in the world, committing to establish the world's biggest virtual power plant, beginning with housing trust homes. These are world-leading initiatives and they're happening here in South Australia. Um, so uh, South Australia is a progressive state in this area and we also have got a range of other things we should be incredibly proud of. It's not just action on climate change. We lead the nation on stormwater and wastewater recycling. We export that capacity to the world. We've increased the total size of wilderness protection areas from 70,000 hectares in 2002 to 1.8 million hectares now. And under my leadership, a million hectares added in the last period since I've been in this role. We've got in place nation-leading partnerships with Aboriginal people to co-manage national parks. We've protected pristine sea environments by establishing a network of 19 marine parks with 83 sanctuary zones. And South Australia today has a waste industry that employs about 5,000 people and adds more than a billion dollars to our economy. The circular economy is not only great for our environment, it creates jobs. There's more jobs in recycling than there is in landfill and this is a great opportunity for us. We've demonstrated we're a strong supporter for public transport. We've redone the whole of the public transport network. We've made it easier for people to get access to it. We're backing the production and use of low emission vehicles, including electric and driverless vehicles. We're 100% behind cycling, having added 1,000 kilometres of bike tracks, and we've also introduced protections to better protect cyclists and so much more. <laughs> <laughs> There's more of that. You'll get an opportunity. So, all right. Okay. okay. It was fairly Beat obvious. Beat the buzzer. Beat the buzzer. <laughs> That's what it's like. This is a game. Okay. Away you go, Stephen. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming along to my parliamentary colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. The Liberal Party cares about the environment. The Liberal Party wants to protect the environment. And the Liberal Party wants to enhance the environment. That means that we need to move away from some of the greenwash that we've seen from this government over the last 16 years. The facts are that South Australians love their natural environment and they want a government uh, which is going to involve them in protecting it. Too many times uh, in the last 16 years we've seen uh, locals with a lot of knowledge cut off while the bureaucrats and the government think that they know what's best for the environment in South Australia. The Liberal Party's approach will be practical and it will centre around involving the people right across this state. The Liberal Party's commitments are clear. We oppose a high-level nuclear waste facility in South Australia. We will establish a moratorium on unconventional gas exploration and extraction in the southeast, and we'll keep this moratorium in place for a 10-year period. We want a practical approach to investing in vital energy infrastructure. The Liberal Party uh, wants to uh, make sure that we can have an interconnector with New South Wales so that we can have uh, baseload coming in 
uh, from that area to uh, help us with our uh, intermittent renewable energy in South Australia, but also to create that highway out of South Australia to take our renewable energy into New South Wales so that it can increase their uh, We want more money uh, to be spent uh, in coastal protection. In fact, we've already announced a further $5 million going to, into this area, which has been completely and utterly neglected by this government. We want more national parks officers. In fact, we're proposing uh, an increase of more than 20% uh, of uh, the number of national parks uh, officers. Uh, we would like to protect open space at Glenthorne Park. In fact, we'll legislate to protect open space at Glenthorne Park. We don't want to see this uh, wholly or partially turned into a housing development. In fact, we want to see it uh, become part of a new uh, state, metropolitan national park, Glenthorne Park. We will completely overhaul our broken NRM system, uh, which has been moved into uh, the department. It's become very centralised, very bureaucratised, and has cut off a lot of people in the local community who have got good practical solutions of what we should be doing. Uh, we will make sure that we devolve the governance of this back to the regions and have people uh, elected locally on that board, not just uh, appointed by the Minister. We'll put $2 million into grassroots grants to support local groups to undertake practical outcome-based projects right across South Australia. We'll establish Green Adelaide to protect and enhance our urban ecology in South Australia. Uh, we will support uh, the government's move to uh, have this Royal Commission uh, into the River Murray and the uh, alleged theft of water up the river, but we won't allow uh, the politicisation of, of, of the River Murray to scuttle uh, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, which is on track uh, to actually deliver the environmental flows that we so desperately need here at the end of the river. And finally, uh, the Liberal Party will make sure that we have a dedicated Cabinet Minister with responsibility for the environment, with no other responsibilities, just solely focused uh, on environmental improvement here in South Australia. 24 Hello. seconds left. Oh. <laughs> Do you want to trade that to anyone? No. I'm here to help. Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the SABS candidate for weight, Graham Davies, who's helped formulate our environment policy, who's a chartered engineer and a former vice president of the Conservation Council. Without a healthy environment, our society, our economy is pretty much stuffed. And that's why I want to address, firstly, the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, back in 2009, I negotiated with the then Rudd government when they needed my vote over the stimulus package to get almost a billion dollars uh, more money into the Murray-Darling Basin in terms of half a billion dollars for water buybacks, $200 million for river communities, and $200 million for stormwater harvesting that we've been slipping behind on, which is a very good way of preventing water going into uh, the ocean and uh, being used to, to, to green our cities. Um, that was a good thing to do. I'm concerned that we've seen very serious allegations of water theft and water rotting. I support the State Royal Commission, but I also think that a Federal Royal Commission with broader jurisdictional powers would be preferable for the Liberal Party, uh, your Federal colleagues, to characterise um, my, my Federal colleagues voting for the disallowance motion moved by Sarah Hanson Young into the, the Northern Basin, uh, supported by Labor, to say that it means less water for the river system is, I think, Orwellian spin. The fact is we cannot countenance uh, rotting and theft of the river system. We need the plan to work uh, in its current form. That's very, very important. Uh, on climate change, of course we support the Paris Agreement targets and that should be a minimum benchmark. I'm less optimistic uh, than the Premier and no criticism. I think what the Trump administration has done has been absolutely destructive and it shows that America's leadership uh, in the world is actually shrinking and Europe has been taking it up. Uh, on marine parks, we support a network of marine parks with sanctuary zones based on strong science, not political interference. We've got 5,000 kilometres of uh, coastline uh, in this state, and that's why drilling in the Great Australian Bight uh, should not be allowed. The precautionary principle guides us in environmental policy. The fact is, um, if anything goes wrong, uh, then the consequences are catastrophic. And along with former Green Senator Robert Sims, we co-sponsored a Senate inquiry into that, which I thought was quite instructive. Uh, on NRM reform, uh, I agree with Stephen that there is a real issue uh, with the way the laudable aims of the NRM uh, have been really um, uh, scuttled in many respects by a very heavy-handed bureaucracy and people on the land, those that care about the land, have been disenfranchised and disempowered. Uh, 
In terms of renewable energy, um, I helped negotiate, I negotiated directly with Matthias Cormann to get that $110 million concessional loan backed by the State Government's Power Purchase Agreement. That $650 million project is outstanding. It actually is leading the nation and it is a world beater in terms of its size. It will reduce power prices, it's dispatchable power, it's not intermittent renewable power and that's something that uh, SA Best is very proud of and we need to see more, not less of those projects because that dispatchable renewable power is the way of the future. How many seconds do I have left? You've got 57 seconds left. Oh my God, I can keep going yeah, if you want. You've got to develop some more policy. <laughs> no, no, I'm happy to. Okay. So, thank you. Oh, hello. Right, OK. Uh, Mark, thank you. OK, now thanks, Lisa, and thanks, Bonnie, for your welcome to country. The Greens' vision for the environment after this election is an environment that is, is clean and it's healthy and it's resilient. And most important, I think, is that it ramps up a notch in government decision-making, government thinking and in policy development. It needs to be at the heart of so many areas rather than siloed into just uh, plain environmental thinking. I don't think it's an unrealistic objective. In fact, uh, it's eminently doable and it is absolutely essential. But it's not going to happen by accident. Uh, you'll be shocked to hear this, but the Greens aren't aspiring to form government this time around. Uh, we're, we're waiting a little bit longer. Um, but certainly the role that we've played uh, in the Upper House, and I acknowledge my, my colleague Tammy Franks and uh, my colleague Senator Sarah Hanson-Young, uh, we kick uh, goals, uh, we punch above our weight in state parliament. But wishful thinking alone isn't going to uh, get us there. Uh, we do need to start prioritising our national systems, nat sorry, natural systems, and a good starting point is to look at the budget. Now, in years gone by, uh, spending on the environment was about 3% of the state budget. It's now down to about 1.5%. Spending on the environment has been in free fall for a decade. And that has implications on the ground. As many people here I know who work, for example, in uh, native vegetation, you've seen the number of officers uh, who've been let go from the department. The issue of environmental rights is important because, especially with an audience like this, so many people here have been fighting for decades to protect the environment and enhance the environment. And your rights are few and they're getting less. Uh, for example, in the planning arena, your ability to influence decisions is being very much curtailed. Don't trust uh, citizens' charters, they won't do it. Your rights in relation to mining, you have none. And I'm speaking as an environmental lawyer. So we do need to insist on the government doing the right thing, spending the right amounts of money, but we also need to make sure that as citizens we have the power to hold the government to account. I'll give you an example. We were debating our public health laws a few years ago. I moved an amendment which said it should be an objective for all South Australians to live in a clean and healthy environment. Hardly radical, nothing that anyone would disagree with. Our right to live in a clean and healthy environment. Of course it was voted down because governments are scared to allow people to have what might be seen as rights, especially rights that might be enforceable. That was very disappointing. Um, the divine right of governments to make executive decisions that are unchallengeable has to end, and that's something the Greens have been working on. Given that we've been talking um, uh, about the very things, and we will today, about the things that keep us alive, uh, clean air, fertile soils, uh, fresh water, um, it's remarkable that uh, this election the environment hasn't had as much uh, priority, so I really welcome the opportunity uh, today to talk about it. In terms of the Greens' uh, uh, performance, I'm proud of many things we've done. If you've got solar panels on your roof and you're an early adopter, thank the Greens for that generous feed-in tariff. Back when the panels cost four times as much and were only half as efficient, uh, we helped kickstart that industry. And uh, when the call was made to end all the tariffs, we managed to get a softer landing for the industry by having a secondary uh, feed-in tariff. Uh, Arcarula, you know, we, we sent that cowboy company marathon packing. You know, they wanted to trash the Arcarula Wilderness Sanctuary. But there's more. They're back. They've rebadged, renamed, under new ownership, uh, now called Lee Creek Energy. And they want to impose underground coal gasification on South Australia. It's got to be the most dirty, polluting and dangerous activity that you could think of for extracting what's left of fossil fuels in the ground. 
We, um, we've supported all different parties in Parliament on, depending on the merits of the issue. So certainly uh, we actually sided with the Liberals, as it turned out, to see off that ill-conceived international uh, nuclear waste dump. Uh, fast forward a few days, we side with Labor to defend marine parks and, uh, and the sanctuary zones that are there. And this has been alluded to already just recently at the federal level, and I acknowledge my colleague, Senator Sarah Hanson-Young, we've managed to fight off the greed of the uh, upstream eastern states irrigators who want less water for our environment and more water in their dams. So there are a lot of things, and we'll, we'll cover them in question time today, but uh, the Greens are proud to uh, stand on our environmental record, and we look forward to continuing that work in the parliament to come. Thank you all. Now on to the questions. For our first question, I'd like to invite Marilyn Paxton to ask the first question uh, about gas fields in the southeast. Marilyn is actually from the southeast, so away you Thank go. you, Thank Lisa. You. Um, Marilyn Paxton, I'm a committee member of the Limestone Coast Protection Alliance. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me here today. Gas is responsible for much of South Australia's recent power price rise. There is huge community opposition to turning the southeast vineyards and prime agricultural land into an industrial gas field. Just this week, gas flaring from a new conventional well near Panola was so high and bright that it could be seen in Mount Gambier, 40 kilometres away. Mr Weatherall, why is your government continuing to pay gas companies to explore new fields in the southeast when renewable energy is very quickly becoming cheaper. Mr Marshall, Mr Xenophon, I congratulate you for your promised 10-year moratorium on fracking, but it's not enough. Why aren't you also banning all other gas development when any drilling requires punching holes in aquifers threatening south e the southeast's vital groundwater, polluting our air, and putting the southeast high value agricultural land and economy at huge risk. The question is for all of you. Thank you. Perhaps Jay will go with your response first. We won't support any proposal, whether it's conventional or unconventional, which uh, puts at risk the natural environment or the other productive uses in the southeast. It's as simple as that. But we'll be guided by science, we'll be based on the, uh, the processes that uh, have been put in place that have protected the natural environment in places where we've seen unconventional uh, extraction of gas in the Cooper Basin for about 60 years now. So that's the approach that will be taken. To directly answer your question, gas is an important transitional fuel. It's half as carbon polluting uh, as coal and uh, in the current environment, um, it does. It is an important uh, element of making sure that we have a strong and stable, affordable and effective uh, electricity supply system. I take issue with your your analysis about it being the cause of the uh, of price rises. The, the biggest cause of the price rises is essentially market power, and it's the fact that there aren't enough uh, generators that are on, including gas or other plume generators that were here able to actually provide supply. So what? Uh, what we've seen is, because of the dithering about climate policy being integrated with energy policy, what we've seen is essentially a whole range of power stations, coal and gas, being driven out of the system because there's been no certainty about how to invest. So there's the world we're in now, there's the world we want to get to, which I hope will be very substantially renewable, especially with these new technologies around storage that can provide base load storage, such as solar thermal, but in the meantime, we still have to provide uh, strong, stable energy supplies for our nation. Well, from the Liberal Party's perspective, we're very clear on this. Uh, we uh, have followed up with the recommendation of the Standing Committee uh, report. There was an extensive investigation in the South Australian Parliament, uh, many hundreds of uh, submissions which were made. The recommendation uh, following on from that was uh, that there not be uh, further um, uh, fracking uh, in the southeast for uh, the time being until there was uh, a, a local uh, commitment to this project, which there clearly uh, hasn't been. So uh, we put that position into place as quickly as possible. 
uh, and now we have our formalised position, which is moratorium on fracture stimulation in the southeast. But we're not moving away from our position regarding conventional gas exploration and extraction, uh, nor are we moving away from our current position regarding fracture stimulation in other parts of the state. This goes to classic issues of land use conflict, and particularly in terms of the precautionary principle, we are dealing with prime agricultural land, and Dennis Vice from the South East has had many conversations with me on this great winemaker. Um, that's where the risk is in terms of water table, uh, tables and the like. So that's why uh, support a moratorium on fracking, uh, not satisfied that it can be done safely. Uh, the other thing that needs to be, and, and there's this land use conflict that's a constant tension under the Mining Act, for instance. When you look at what happened federally with coal seam gas, different from what's happening in the South East, the federal parliament uh, through, through lobbying and, and when Tony Windsor had a casting vote in a balanced power situation in the lower house, insisted on there being a water trigger for these sorts of projects where there had to be a rigorous scientific evaluation. Um, that's the sort of thing that we could be looking at at a state level um, and I think we need to go an extra step further. Uh, conventional, uh, our, our position is uh, moratorium on unconventional, uh, conventional, but it should be subject to uh, an appropriate water trigger where there's a thorough evaluation. I think the Premier and the Opposition Leader, it needs to be guided by the science, but I think the science on, on fracking is very clear. Um, thanks, Marilyn. As, as you know, it was the Greens that got that inquiry up and running, and we were glad that the Liberals came on board with their 10-year uh, moratorium. But we do need to go further. The Greens introduced a bill into State Parliament which would have protected all agricultural land, conservation land, and urban land from uh, from gas and other invasive mining um, as a starting point. We couldn't get any support in the Parliament for that. Um, I've been to the US, I've been to Pennsylvania, I've seen the impact that uh, gas has on local communities. Um, now, clearly there are two sides to the impact. There's the local impacts you've talked about in terms of uh, aquifers, and especially we're talking about drilling three or four or more kilometres down, you're going to go through aquifers. But you've also got the global impacts. And when scientists tell us that if we're serious about climate change, we have to leave the vast bulk of remaining fossil fuels in the ground, why on earth um, are we digging them up? So I'm very proud of the southeast community. Um, uh, it's been on the ground, active. Uh, I've seen, I've been down for the ceremonies. You've, you've seen some districts 97% and that was asking every single person down there have said they don't want to live in a gas field. So I'd like to see the moratorium that other parties have adopted uh, become a permanent ban so we protect our valuable farmland. Our next question is about climate and energy. So South Australia is a national leader in renewable energy and storage, but the federal government's national energy guarantee risks sending new renewable investment off a cliff. Will you commit to increasing, not scrapping, South Australia's renewable energy target and opposing the federal government's national energy guarantee? Perhaps we'll go with you first, Stephen, on this one. Well, the Liberal Party wants a national approach. I mean, that is what will deliver us the best outcome as a nation. We don't believe the go it alone is the right uh, strategy. This hasn't served us particularly well in South Australia. I think our recent uh, bungled transition towards more renewable energy uh, has delivered the highest price least reliable grid uh, in the nation. Now, nobody's arguing that we don't need uh, to move towards more renewable energy, but it's managing that transition in a logical, planned and orderly way so that it doesn't compromise cost of living for people in South Australia, job opportunities in South Australia as uh, Labor Party has inflicted upon the people of this state. We're supported uh, in this uh, with the uh, national review uh, which was done. We've supported this by the uh, Clean Energy Council of Australia who want a national approach uh, to this area uh, and that's what the Liberal Party will be doing. Our uh, specific measures uh, which are to increase the interconnectivity between New South Wales and South Australia will result in more renewable energy uh, being used right across the country, not just in South Australia, sub-optimising here in South Australia, but right across the nation, in particular uh, into New South Wales. So I think, uh, quite frankly, this is the best approach. Um, in terms of the, the politics of climate change are very fraught. Back in 2009, when Malcolm Turnbull's opposition leader, <laughs> Uh, we jointly commissioned, Malcolm and I jointly commissioned Frontier Economics to undertake uh, to look at an alternative emissions uh, trading scheme. 
which the modelling back then indicated would, could have led to deeper reductions in emissions uh, at a lower cost. Uh, Federal Labor then dismissed it as a, quote, mongrel of a scheme. Uh, seven years Labor, uh, later, Labor adopted it as their policy after the Liberals walked away from it when Tony Abbott became opposition leader. I note that Frontier Economics, who I've dealt with over many years, has been giving uh, advice to the state government on uh, their energy plan um, because of their expertise in energy policy. I think what we need to do here is that in terms of the National Energy Guarantee, it looks like a dog's breakfast. Uh, we haven't ruled it out uh, in terms, but in its current form, I think it has a number of very deep flaws. I think we also need to look more broadly at the uh, national electricity market. Um, the initial intent of that over 20 years ago seems to have been walked away from, and I think that we need to look at, at being a, a, about the states ensuring their energy future and I'm concerned that it's become a very messy, heavily centralised bureaucratic body. So uh, the key to this is with a national energy guarantee, uh, I think it has some serious flaws and we're not sold uh, on it yet and we need to look at reform of the NEM, making sure we meet our Paris Agreement pro uh, targets. Well, the, the, um, I'm happy to wait. No, that's right. <laughs> The, um, the Greens uh, strongly support renewable energy targets. We support them at the federal level, we support them at the state level. What people often forget is that it was those national targets that uh, resulted in much of that early investment in South Australia. Because if you're a big uh, national or a global player and you've got to build some renewable energy somewhere, you might as well build it where you get more bang for your buck, and that was in South Australia. And that, I think, was, was kick-starting uh, the industry here. I disagree uh, with the Liberal position about this bungled uh, transition. I don't think it's any such thing. People conveniently forget that we had coal-fired uh, uh, power stations spitting the dummy in hot weather. Uh, we had gas-fired power stations similarly that were catching fire and not working and, and running out of gas and all sorts of things. Um, we had a parliamentary inquiry, and that determined that when you have tornadoes that knock down transmission lines, the power tends to go out. Um, <laughs> So I think we need to um, by no means be complacent and just say, yeah, we just go to 100% renewable, it'll be easy, nothing else to do. Of course there is a transition we have to manage and it's going to involve a lot of storage um, and we've got to get that right. Um, national uh, energy uh, guarantee, similarly we had um, a state uh, energy security regulation which was similarly flawed and I'm glad the government appears to have walked away from that. Um, there are some powerful forces, I think, certainly within industry and also within government, that pretends that it's only things like real inertia, spinning wheels, that can service our needs. We know that batteries can serve a lot of those needs and do it better and do it faster. And I think Jay's uh, uh, big battery uh, showed uh, that within a fraction of a second it can respond. We can do more of that. On the, the 13th of February, Stephen, you joined uh, Victoria and Queensland to announce that you'd scrap the state-based renewable energy targets. Uh, what you're essentially doing is putting each of the states, and either, either, you, either it's an extraordinary coincidence or you collaborated in making that decision in cooperation with your federal colleagues, all announcing exactly the same policy on the same day. No regard to what was in South Australia's interests and the fact that South Australia has leadership in renewable energy and that this would curtail the leadership that, that we've actually already established and also the reputation we've established. You wanted to put us in the hands of that same group of people in the federal parliament that hand around lumps of coal during question time. <laughs> now, if you think that's a good idea, I'm not with you. Um, and, and what, and, well, I'm not, I've got something for you as well. <laughs> uh, the, the, you raced into, I think, 35 minutes, a world record. You must have broken a hamstring getting into a TV studio on the night of the blackout to say that the generators don't work when the wind is blowing too hard. Now, that's just, one is it's false, two, it didn't happen that night, and three, you've never apologised for that, or the fact that you said that the Royal Adelaide Hospital was blacked out that night. This sort of scaremongering about renewable energy, including your remarks, how can, you, how can you have people that turned into wind farm refugees because of the noise, the infrastructure, the low frequency noise that actually affects brain activity is ruining their lives? I mean, <laughs> it's this sort of nonsense that will, I mean, what you've got, if, if you choose the Liberal Party or Nick Xenophon at the next election, what you will have is sending a message 
to the nation and to the world that we're turning our back on renewable energy because that, that is the unmistakable conclusion that will be reached. And make no mistake, this next election will be treated, whether we like it or not, as a referendum on renewable energy. If we go down, they'll be wagging their fingers at everybody around the nation to say that's what happened if you push too hard into renewable energy. That's what the Prime Minister's trying to do and that's what's going to happen. Uh, so this is a very important election for our future leadership in renewable energy. And is that why you're spending over $400 million on diesel generators and uh, a gas fueled emergency standby generator for South Australia? Because two thirds of your entire energy budget has got nothing to do with renewables. Gas fired state owned generator uh, and a massive investment, $112 million in diesel generators. That's what your policies have cost the taxpayers of South Australia. We have a broken national electricity market. We've had a decade that the culture wars over climate change not being incorporated into energy policy has mean that we've had a decade of underinvestment. And South Australians expect me to keep the lights on. And it is an extreme measure. There's no doubt about Diesel that. And gas. It will also be will also be much more efficient and much less carbon polluting than that clunker you wanted to keep open up at Port Augusta. Because what we're that's what we're doing. We're trying to make sure that we have both a sustainable energy system, but keep our eye on a future which will be driven by renewable energy. And you've Why encumbered... Turning the lights off? Yeah. 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 Oh, that's a good idea as well. well. Flick them off, go on. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we'll move on. Did you want to respond to anything there quickly, uh, just, very just, quickly, Nick? I just might say this as dispassionately as possible. In, in terms of a Senate inquiry, a Senate Select Committee inquiry that Sarah chaired uh, uh, on, uh, the, on the the events in September 2016, there were a couple of reports that came forward as a result of that inquiry from the Department of Premier and Cabinet, Cabinet well before uh, Jay became Premier. But those reports essentially said, uh, important to transition to renewable energy, but do it well in terms of ensuring good stability and proper planning. And I think that's a quite a reasonable, dispassionate thing to say. Okay, let's move on. Uh, our next question is around the Great Australian Bight. Proposals to carry out risky deep sea oil drilling in the Great Australian Bight have been met with huge community opposition across southern Australia. To date, an unprecedented six councils have passed resolutions raising serious concern. It's clear that the impacts on the pristine waters of the Bight are unacceptable and South Australia does not have the capacity to respond to a catastrophic oil spill. Risking our coastline, our tourism industry and our fishing industry makes no sense. It's a credit to the Greens and SA Best for standing up and opposing all oil and gas exploration activity in the Great Australian Bight. Mr Weatherall and Mr Marshall, what is your position on this highly, highly irresponsible proposal? Well, from our, our perspective, uh, we uh, stand by the arrangements uh, that are in place using Noxema to evaluate uh, any potential uh, drilling in the Great Australia Bight. Um, I, I make the point uh, that Nick Xenophon and SA Best have previously made it clear that they don't support uh, the Noxema methodology. In fact, they would like to have politicians deciding whether things should go ahead or not. Uh, we would, in the Liberal Party, prefer uh, science uh, to uh, be the adjudicator. Um, I, I note that other people have put up uh, applications for drilling in the Great Australian uh, Bight. They've been rejected by Noxema uh, to date. We certainly won't support any uh, plan for drilling in the Bight where the environment will be compromised. Can I, can I say also that any negative impacts uh, from oil and gas exploration in the pristine waters of the Bight are, are utterly unacceptable. Um, we think that the risk of any potential environmental accident uh, and its effect on not only our natural environment but also the tourism and fishing industries is uh, one which, if it's not managed, is utterly unacceptable. So we will not support any exploration in the Great Australia Bight that would risk our environment or our reputation as a clean, safe and sustainable food producer. We have a, while it is a national process, we do have a role we can play in establishing the standards that NOTSEMA will apply to the regulatory process. So we intend to participate in that process in a way which will mean that we have the stringent, most stringent environmental outcomes. 
we think that uh, given the nature of the, it's a highly unusual and uh, dangerous environment, very deep water ar arrangement, uh, we think that in those circumstances, uh, those strict environmental standards will make it very difficult for an application to be successful. And if that's the result, uh, we're content with that. Uh, we're very happy to uh, make sure that we have the strictest possible environmental standards. But by the same token, we, we also need to make sure that we're consistent about using science to guide our approaches. Science guides our approach uh, to climate change. It guides our approach to marine parks. It guides our approach to fracture stimulation. And it will guide our approach to this as well. And that's the important thing, that it's not decisive. Science is only a servant. It's not, it's not a master. But, but it is a very important part of the process and uh, that's the approach that we'll be taking. Lisa? Um, one of the important things I think is that, um, following on from science-based, um, most of us would have seen the maps that the Wilderness Society commissioned, which showed summer and winter scenarios, where the oil would go and what proportion of, of our coastline would be closed for fishing because it was too polluted. And you saw these, pollu these plumes going through Bass Strait, you know, past uh, Tasmania, remarkable. So yes, science-based. But given a lot of that uh, activity is federally regulated, there is, there is more that the state government can do because no offshore facility can survive without on-land facilities. So the clear message I think that all parties need to give is that they will not be supporting on-land facilities to support the offshore oil activities. The problem with drilling the Great Australian Bight is that if something goes wrong, it goes spectacularly wrong. And the modelling I've seen, which hasn't been controverted, uh, is that you could end up with oil spills all the way to, to the Victorian coastline, uh, depending on uh, the season. And uh, the proponents haven't been able to satisfy, um, obviously not SEMA at this stage, that they could cap uh, um, a, um, a spill, uh, they could cap a, a catastrophic event in the bite. And, and that's what I'm concerned about. The reason I suggested that there be an additional layer of, uh, of, of protection was that, uh, in terms of ministerial intervention, was this, that I think that the current uh, framework for NOPSEMA doesn't take into account uh, the, the risks and the uh, economic impacts and social impacts and environmental impacts if something goes wrong. I think that the criteria was somewhat too narrow. So there might be an argument there to expand NOPSEMA's criteria for what they do, but um, if something goes wrong in the bite, we're pretty much stuffed in terms of all our coastline. So the clarity you would, you would keep or lose NOPSEMA? No, you still have NOPSEMA, uh, strengthen the criteria and as an absolute safeguard ensure that, uh, so, you know, as the Premier said, science is our uh, servant, not our master. But ultimately, um, I think that there is a role for ministerial discretion in extraordinary circumstances. So that's a new policy today? No, that's what that was announced uh, some time ago. Right. Okay. On to marine parks. So recent surveys indicate that South Australians love our marine parks with public support at a remarkable 90%. The evidence is clear that marine sanctuaries provide considerable, considerable benefits for our ama amazing marine life and the state's economy. Will you guarantee that none of the current sanctuaries will be wound back? And if not, why not? Uh, so perhaps we'll go to you first, Jay. Yeah, well, it's one of the proudest uh, things I managed to achieve as Environment Minister and concluded when I was <coughs> Premier was the establishment of these 19 marine parks. It was the most ex extensive consultation process that I've been involved in in government. Uh, it uh, was extraordinary and it went over many, many years and involved and engaged with communities. It was based on science. We had a fantastic scientific panel. Uh, we went the length and breadth of South Australia speaking to people. Uh, and uh, this, this is going to set us up for the future. We only need to look at Gulf St Vincent to see what happens of, you know, decades and decades of insults to a coastline, what it can do to the natural environment. But we still have the opportunity to protect and save many other important parts of South Australia. But I'm gravely concerned uh, with Stephen's remarks where he said the Liberal Party worked very hard two or three years ago in the Parliament to scale back the marine park legislation. And uh, we introduced legislation in the parliament to scale back the number of sanctuary zones. So that's what you're getting under Liberal. 
And of course, he was supported in that by John Daly, who then uh, was a member of uh, Nick Xenophon's party in the upper house when uh, he voted for that legislation. Now, I anticipate Nick might say he doesn't, you know, he's never met the bloke, uh, but uh, he, was a, he was elected on your ticket, Nick, and this is the problem. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people we haven't met before that might be elected on your ticket, and uh, we need to know how they're going to vote. Uh, and in relation to marine parks, uh, you've already voted, or one of your people has already voted once to scale them back, and we're gravely concerned that that could happen again. Well, we're very clear on this uh, position. We do support the marine uh, parks and the, uh, the keeping of all of the existing marine parks. We do want to use science uh, to look at the sanctuary zone or the zone arrangements in there. We've already highlighted that we've been presented uh, with evidence in the past that some of the sanctuary zones uh, could become habitat protection zones. So a, a lower level of protection, yes, but we think at the requisite level. Uh, the reality is that the Premier says that there was extensive uh, consultation with communities across South Australia. Uh, he might have uh, glossed over it, but there was a lot of angst where a lot of communities felt that they were completely disenfranchised with the decision making. Not one single fisherman in the state wants to do over the very waters that they derive their income from. Not one. So the reality is that the fishermen in South Australia have every reason to ensure that sanctuary zones and habitat protection zones and exclusion zones are in exactly the right place. But we didn't use science in South Australia to determine those. The government used a methodology which wasn't used in any other state of Australia, and that was to come up with a representative sample of all waters in South Australia. So locking away uh, areas where there was no evidence to suggest uh, that there was uh, damage to those areas from fishing. Uh, we want a science-based approach. We want an evidence-based approach. Uh, we will review uh, those areas and we believe that there could be uh, some changes, but it will be based on science uh, and the environment and that's our commitment. So I just have a note here uh, that you're, you're having a review when it's not due under the marine parks legislation for some years and the scientific evidence is already showing that the significant benefits of sanctuary zones to the health of the marine environment. So why the review? Because uh, there are a lot of uh, sanctuary uh, zones and I don't believe that there has been a comprehensive review of what the, the, the costs and benefits are. And as I make the point, you know, fishermen don't want to pillage uh, the water. They've got, we've got very strong uh, controls from fisheries in South Australia. There was no evidence. I mean, we presented with all of this, all of this talk on, on, on talkback radio where people said, look, this is, these are pristine environments. We want to protect them. And then we would always say, but there's fishing allowed in them at the moment. Yes. And they're pristine. Yes. But you want to lock people out. I mean, there wasn't evidence that the fishing in some areas, and we're not talking about all areas, but a small number that we've identified where there is opportunity where uh, fishing uh, can uh, take place uh, in, uh, in habitat protection zones rather than sanctuary zones. And it's completely wrong to characterise the Liberal Party's position that we want to do away with marine parks. I'm sick to death of hearing this. We supported the legislation. We will keep all of the existing marine parks in place. We will review in a small number of cases using science, using evidence, uh, the zone arrangements. So, so basically it needs to be science based. I think the, the, the point of contention is whether the methodology was appropriate. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but what I, I do know is if there's, if there's it going to be any review, it needs to be uh, independent and robust and thorough uh, in respect of that. That was the contention of some local fishers, uh, but we need to keep that marine park sanctuary. I think the framework of it is a very good framework. It's a question of whether it's you know, the differences between general managed use zones, habitat protection, sanctuary zones and restricted zones. So uh, any approach would need to be a cautious one, uh, but I think that um, uh, if the allegation that the methodology was in some way flawed, uh, that could be looked at, but I, I don't think we should rush to change anything until we've had that uh, appropriate review. Um, Green's position is pretty simple. Um, the sanctuary zones are at the heart of the marine protected area system. The areas where they are protected from other exploitative, exploitative activities. So much of the remainder of parks is what you could often call a Clayton's 
park, you know, the park you have when you're not having a park, a bit like a regional reserve, you can mine it, you can graze it. These sanctuary zones are absolutely critical and the Greens will fight tooth and nail to keep them. We are very pleased that the mechanism that was created ensures that they cannot be undone without a vote of Parliament and that's how it should be. Um, the vote is much closer than I would like and I would think that as future generations come through, they're going to thank us, not curse us, for protecting some of these uh, most important marine areas as sanctuaries. Now, for our next question on nuclear waste, I'd like to invite Vivian McKenzie, an Adnamutna woman from the Flinders Ranges, whose family borders uh, one of the proposed sites. So please, Vivian, your question. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Vivian McKenzie. And um, the question is, we welcome the news that the proposal for an international high-level waste facility in South Australia has been rejected but we still face the threat of a waste dump for the national radioactive waste in South Australia. This proposal is a cause of concern in the affected communities of Kimber on the Air Peninsula and it has ripped through my community, ripped my community apart in the Flinders Ranges. The Premier has been proactive around writing to the Prime Minister and the Senefon team has initiated a Senate inquiry and we know that the Greens are opposed. Will you actively oppose the federal radioactive waste dump, including through using the existing state legislation to say no? Up to you first, Stephen. Uh, well, uh, I've got to say, um, I appreciate your comments regarding the international nuclear waste dump proposed by uh, Jay Weatherill and Labor. Uh, we looked at uh, this uh, issue very carefully and we arrived that this would be a disaster for South Australia, uh, especially in terms of our um, the way that we're perceived internationally. We have so many uh, fantastic exports out of South Australia, Australia and we want to protect uh, our reputation as being a clean and green uh, producer of food uh, and fibre for the world. Um, in terms of the uh, low-level uh, nuclear waste uh, repository, uh, we have been a supporter that this, we do need a national approach uh, to this issue. At the moment we've got a whole pile of low-level nuclear waste, which is completely inappropriately stored, and I think all sides of politics agree that it is currently completely inappropriately stored, probably not too far from where we are uh, at the moment. This is a federal area uh, of uh, jurisdiction. My understanding is that they are looking at uh, sites at the moment. We certainly encourage uh, the federal government to make sure that they are uh, doing that planning in consultation uh, with local uh, groups. Uh, so that we don't have a, a hostile uh, environment. We do need a national, low-level uh, nuclear waste repository. Uh, it's a very vexed question. We can bury our head in the sand for a very long period of time uh, or we can actually make the decision uh, to establish it. It is, federal, uh, it is a federal uh, environment um, and, uh, you know, so there's not a huge amount uh, of involvement that we can have at the state level, but we do encourage the feds to work with uh, host communities to make sure that they are they they consent to to the arrangement. In terms of the high level uh, dump, um, it wasn't just the reputational risks uh, to the state uh, to our clean green image, but the economics of it just didn't make sense to me. The the revenue projections uh, were based on us having basically a monopoly, heroic, uh, a heroic, a heroic. I think Sir Humphrey probably would have said or courageous assumptions that we would have got all this money from it, but. All you needed was one other place in the world to have a competing dump, high-level dump, and the price uh, that we could command for, for that dump, uh, for keeping the waste there, uh, would have plummeted. So I, 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 and it, or if the Finns, and I know the Premier did the right thing by, by visiting the Finnish facility, if they drilled another tunnel, I think that would have um, dropped the price as well. So, so on that, it just didn't stack up from a reputational risk point of view, leaving aside any other safety issues which are obviously important, but also the economics didn't, just didn't make sense to me. And it's something we'd be stuck with for 10,000 years, um, which um, uh, is pretty long in the political cycle. Uh, the other thing is, if a week's a long time in politics, is more than an eternity. In terms of low-level dump, I know my, uh, my colleague, um, uh, Rex Patrick, who took over my Senate seat, uh, has been pursuing this. I was trying to get answers from Matt Canavan, who was responsible for this, uh, saying that we won't put it anywhere without um, a strong community support or, or words to that effect. We're trying to work out what that criteria is, and we've got this huge freedom of information battle that could probably end up in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal because they won't tell us. Now, if there's that lack of transparency, that worries me. 
I agree with Stephen, clearly we need to put at low level waste from nuclear medicine that saves people's lives. Um, um, it needs to be in an appropriate repository, but it must be done in a way where there is appropriate and genuine community consent, uh, and of course to, to minimise all the risks inherent with that. Sorry, and I stand corrected. An intermediate waste in addition to the medical waste. Put it under bubble now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The Federal or state? <laughs> Both. <laughs> okay, the Greens' position on this is pretty clear. You know where we stand. We oppose the dump. We were glad to see off that ill-conceived uh, international nuclear waste dump. My main sadness around that is the at least $13 million that was wasted on what was from day one um, an exercise that was going nowhere. What else could we have spent $13 million on? Um, I, d I disagree with Stephen. He says, well, we do need a, uh, a national uh, radioactive waste dump, do we? I don't think they've got to first base. I don't think they have made the case for the need for a national repository. And as the interjection earlier uh, pointed out, this is mainly about the Lucas Heights uh, waste, uh, some of which has come back from overseas. You talk to doctors about uh, medical waste, some of those radioactive isotopes, they're very short-lived, that's why they put them into your body, and uh, a lot of that stuff does end up uh, degrading very quickly and ending up in landfill. They haven't made the case. Um, I think that uh, the idea of imposing uh, the waste dump uh, on unwilling communities uh, is appalling, and it, is, it has divided those communities at, at Hawker and at Keith, and that's dreadful to see. But let's not forget uh, two important things. One, nuclear waste dumps are illegal in South Australia. We have a state law. And secondly, and um, it always amazes me that the media haven't picked up on this, the site that's being earmarked at Hawker is Crown land uh, that cannot be used for any purpose without uh, Minister Hunter's approval. So the state does have some control. They need to send a message to the Fed saying that parcel of land for that reason is off limits and then we've got to try and help the people at Kimber next. Well, the Labor Party's position, policy position is clear. They don't support a nuclear waste dump and they don't support whether it's intermediate or low level. Um, the approach that, that I took, it's the approach I take with everything, is to ask the big questions. And some of these are big questions that people don't always want to be discussed. But we have a very large proportion of the, the world's uranium and so I ask the question about whether we should have a deeper role in the nuclear fuel cycle. And the Royal Commission looked at that and largely ruled out any involvement except perhaps for the storage of waste. But it also put three important caveats on it. It put a caveat of making sure that there was broad community consent and also specific community consent in terms of location. And we didn't get past first base and so that's dead as an idea. But that approach that we took, which is involving the community and discussing it with the community, is the same approach the federal government should take. We were a bit alarmed about the approach that the federal government took to actually start with a landowner. It was a landowner who commenced this process and made the expression of interest, not a community. Uh, and so it is critical that there is broad community consent. So the first point that Mark raises, is there a need for this in Australia? Is South Australia as a community prepared to be a place that will have this? And then there's a very important separate question, which is specific community consent in a location. We added another gloss uh, as a result of the, the work that we did through the consultation process, and that is a right of veto for the local Aboriginal community, because we believe that was an important safeguard. Uh, and um, if there is going to be confidence built about these things, people have to have the right of veto. It will be the only way that you'll ever build trust in this equation. There will be so much distrust, and we're talking about multi-generational issues here, about which you do need support. It can't be something that one generation supports and another generation opposes. This has to be something which is consent, which is secure, deep and renewed over time. Look, it makes it almost, it's very difficult to get these sorts of, this sort of consent, but that, I think there's no other way of doing it because we've seen lots of starts and, and stops on these types of things around the world. The Finnish actually put it in the hands of the local community and, and gave them the right of veto uh, and they made their choices. Um, but um, I think that the approach the Commonwealth is, is taking is the wrong one. We've written to them, telling them that, and the local community, the local Aboriginal community doesn't support it, and they should be respected in that.
Lisa, I apologise to the people of Keith. I think I might have accidentally yeah, said I'm Keith instead of Kimber. <laughs> They're, they're going to be after me, the people of Keith. I, I love you. I'm sure they'll forgive you. Kimber. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? We have. We've written to them, yeah. I think the, the community... The community... I think the community has is, is indicated that. And, our, and our, our policy is clear. Our policy hasn't changed. It's an ALP policy. And it's, as Mark tells you, it's also the law of South Australia. It's a, there's a piece of legislation which has not been altered. In fact, it's, it was altered to allow us to talk and now it's been re-altered to, to close down even the expending of resources to consult. So we can't even spend money consulting on uh, having a, a low-level waste dump here. Have you written to your uh, federal ALP counterparts as well? Of course. Thank you. All right, we'll just move along. The state government funding for the environment, or state government funding for the environment, sits at only 1.09% of the overall state budget and has been cut by around 40% in the past six years. The election platform asks for parties to commit a minimum of 2% of state budget to the environment, which would mean an increase of 136 million from 16, 17 levels. An investment of $3 million per NRM region per year dedicated to landscape scale projects would be a good start towards achieving this. What are you going to do to increase state government investment in large scale on-ground multi-partner conservation projects? We'll go to you first, Jay. Uh, look, I, while I appreciate that uh, the use of statistics can be a powerful idea, I mean, the truth is there are other parts of the state budget which are growing very strongly, like health and education and child protection. So, sure, it, it is true that the uh, environment has not grown at the same rate, but it's $100 million more than, I think, when we first came into government. And I think it's wrong just to think about our environmental efforts just through the prism of the environmental agencies, as important as they are. We now have a whole system of NRM, uh, which is administered uh, through levies, which are provided, uh, collected through local government, and are doing magnificent on-ground works. And I must take issue with Stephen's characterisation of NRM. It had a recent review, and the federal government itself said it's the best NRM system in the nation. And it has been a very powerful force for improving the quality of management, land management, uh, having regard to environmental considerations in the country. Um, but we shouldn't just think of our environmental efforts just through the environmental agencies. Our public transport efforts are critically important. Uh, the efforts that we're making in terms of renewable energy. We now have a low carbon economy unit within the Department of Premier and Cabinet. And I must say, if there's been an issue that's occupied more of my attention in the last 12 months, it's been this whole question of pushing into action on climate change, preparing ourselves for a low carbon economy. So $150 million renewable technology fund, that's not counted in these figures. The bureaucracy we've set up in Premier and Cabinet around our low carbon economy, that's not counted in these figures. The efforts we're making to encourage public transport uh, is not counted in those figures. In the election campaign, we've announced um, a whole range of measures to upgrade our public transport network. You've seen the massive investments to re-sleep of the whole network, electrify the network, extend it out to Seaford, introduce trams, and we'll have more to say about extensions of trams. Uh, we've introduced the Metro card, and we've actually now put a, a discount, a big discount in for regular users to encourage people. Then there's, of course, all the work we're doing to encourage bike uh, trails, about a thousand kilometres of additional bike trails. So there are parts of government that, that aren't necessarily labelled as, as environment, which are part of this push. But look, we'd like to do more, but we're constrained by what we can do uh, within uh, the, the budget that we have. Uh, we've still got to balance the books and, and do all the other important things that people ask of us. Uh, we will put our fully costed uh, campaign budget out uh, in, in, uh, in as part of this campaign so everybody can see what we're committing to in this area. I've already spoken about our reinvestment in uh, critical areas like more offices in our national parks. Uh, money going into coastal protection, money going into grassroots uh, grant programs. Um, but in addition to that, and I think the Premier makes a good point, there are other areas of public expenditure which need to be uh, considered as part of this overall area. We're very proud in our energy policy uh, to have $200 million committed 
to an interconnect, uh, interconnection uh, fund for South Australia. $150 million for uh, storage, both home-based and grid-scale storage, and a further $30 million looking at a range of demand uh, management, demand aggregation and supply aggregation projects. Uh, so from our perspective, uh, we have $380 million uh, over, over the next four years going into these critical areas which we think uh, support our environment in South Australia. And again, I say to you, by contrast, look very carefully at where the Labor Party is spending their money, their hundreds of millions of dollars on their energy policy. I'll tell you, $112 million going into the diesel generators, $329 million going into the conversion of those over to be gas standby emergency generators, $16 million uh, into their energy policy implementation team, $3 million, $3 million just spent on advertising their energy policy in South Australia. The reality is the Liberal Party is putting dollars directly uh, into practical solutions uh, to improve the use of renewable energy, not only in South Australia, but across the country. Can I, can I yep. just go? I think the issue of enforcement is important. I think that if we have laws in place, uh, there must be adequate resources for enforcement. So I know, understand uh, the issue of budgetary constraints. So um, we need to make sure that the, if laws are broken, environmental laws are broken, they can be adequately enforced. And that's, I think, a given. I just wanted to, in the 57 seconds I should have used earlier, I might use 30 seconds, uh, on waste management that I should have mentioned. We've got a real issue in terms of waste management. Over 75% of our waste is recycled, but it's increasing. Uh, China's ban on waste puts uh, additional pressures, uh, I think, that need to be uh, looked at. Uh, we've got the solid waste levy, which will increase to $103 a tonne by 2019-20 for metro areas and 51.50 non-metro areas. Uh, I think that needs to be reinvested back into growing the industry and further divert waste from landfill. So that's one example where extra money is being raised, I think could actually do a lot of environmental good uh, if that money is hypothecated back uh, uh, to dealing with those environmental issues with landfill. Thank you. Um, simple question of, you know, more money, yes, but it's more money as well as more teeth, uh, as Nick's saying. Is it 2% of the state budget? You know, I think we're setting our sights pretty low here. Um, but uh, yes, and it needs to be to those dedicated environment agencies for whom this is their key responsibility. I'm not disagreeing with what Jay's saying, I'll come back to that in a second, but for example, um, if we had a really powerful uh, native vegetation authority, uh, we wouldn't get situations like we had when people want to build a motor racing track at Tail and Bend, good on them, you know, people love their motor racing, when they don't get permission from the authority to clear the vegetation because there's bugger all left, um, they get the government to pass a special exemption regulation saying, nah, you can clear it. You know, outrageous. We need to fix uh, our laws. Uh, we need to give not just more money, but we need to give more power. Uh, Jay's right, though, in terms of is it other agencies that have responsibility? Yes, it is. At the pointy end, we have our planning authorities. And one of the things I was very pleased to get through last year were two amendments to our planning laws. One says there must be a state planning policy on biodiversity, and the other a state planning policy on climate change. Now, if that's implemented properly, that means that all of those decision makers in that planning space will have to take climate and biodiversity into account when they're making decisions. So yes, other agencies have a role to play, uh, and I'm glad that uh, we've got that into the planning laws, but there's no substitute for directly, adequately funding dedicated environment departments and agencies. So we've got three more questions I'd like to sort of quickly get through. So if we can really stay on topic, that would be fantastic. The River Murray, Barnaby Joyce, when Water Minister, famously stated that there is no hope in Hades of delivering the 450 gigalitres of additional water for the river that was promised under the Basin Plan. At the same time, he proposed to strip 605 gigalitres out of the river through adjustments. The 450 gigalitres of water for the river through improved irrigation efficiency is the only way to deliver the full 3,200 gigalitres basin plan. What will your government do to ensure the federal government and upstream states guarantee the delivery of the full 450 gigalitres of water, which is essential to South Australia, the River Murray and the Coorong? Stand up and fight. <laughs> stand up and fight for every drop of that water. So the first thing I did when I got the job was in the first week I was in the Riverland and that was when we were trying to put this plan together. 
and they were trying to sell to us 2,750 gigalitres. And that last 450, I remember famously uh, uh, we had uh, the Liberal Party, member for MacKillop, saying the 450 gigalitres that Minister Hunter was arguing about is never guaranteed. Shadow Minister for Water, Tim Whetstone, the 450 is something separate from the Basin Plan. My word, it's separate. You can actually see where it is in the plan because we fought for it. It's like the South Australian section because it wasn't in the original plan. And it, it came accompanied by a lockbox of $1.77 billion, which was legislated to pay for it. And then I also negotiated directly with Penny Wong another series of measures, including $150 million for, a, uh, for a, uh, some works down at Ch the Cataracto Pipe, Cataracto uh, floodplain management issue to make sure that we could get that water onto those precious floodplains. This plan is in place because we stood up and fought for it. And now we see they're thieving our water upstream. And now we see extraordinarily uh, some woman that was actually, that had found through satellite imagery that she could see the diversions that were actually going to, to consumptive uses that were meant to be for environmental re uses has now resigned from the authority because the authority refused to publish her work. So we've got a very big problem here. We've got cogent el el uh, evidence of theft. We've got uh, an authority that's hiding uh, certain elements of, of this misbehaviour. And there's only been one state that's ever stood up to the river. It's been South Australia. That's why we've established the Royal Commission. And I've chosen one of the best lawyers in the country to do it, Brett Walker QC. He's a deeply respected jurist. Uh, everybody will accept that his, whatever he finds is going to be, he can take it to the bank. I didn't want to choose a South Australian. We want to choose somebody that... Uh, even the New South Welshman will respect. So when he comes down with his findings, that will be a bombshell. That's why it was a good idea uh, to disallow uh, that attempt to, uh, to allow them to take more water. We need to know what the net result is. That work needs to occur through the Royal Commission. I would have preferred a Federal Royal Commission, uh, but we're advised that uh, he can get everything he needs uh, through us um, using our extraterritorial powers, which can be extended uh, to upstream states. All we need is a connection, and we've got one through the Murray-Darling Basin Agreement and also through the, net, the physical connection of the river. So we can get there. We've got good legal advice that we can subpoena everybody that we need to get there through the Service and Execution of Process Act, which is a federal instrument. So we'll get people to come to us, either willingly or unwillingly. We'll name and shame them if we need to. Uh, but the point of it is that we need basically a healthy river and we need to stand up for it uh, together. Well, we uh, were approached by uh, the Labor government in South Australia to support uh, a separate uh, standalone Royal Commission in South Australia. Uh, we supported that day one. Uh, we think it is important. We do know that I think there are five or six other investigations being carried out simultaneously and we do need to get uh, to the bottom of these very serious allegations. But we in the Liberal Party do not think that we should scuttle the Murray-Darling Basin Plan uh, and the federal legislation along the way. The reality is uh, that this was a very important reform. It was a long time coming. Uh, we are six years into a 14-year agreement. We are on track. Uh, there has already been 2,100 gigalitres uh, that have been recovered for the health of the river. And we are the beneficiaries of that, both now uh, and into the future. We will uh, be able to see the 2750 in place by the middle of next year in accordance uh, with uh, the arrangement. And we, will, uh, we have a commitment from the Prime Minister to deliver the 3200 gigs uh, in time and, uh, on, uh, and in full and on time by 2026. Walking away from the plan now, Walking away from the plan now would be a disaster. Yes, grandstanding. Yes, standing up for South Australia. We've heard it all before. But the reality is what the people of South Australia want, the river communities, uh, for the health of the river and those communities that uh, derive their livelihood from it, they want uh, a Murray-Darling Basin plan which is implemented and it is actually delivered for the people of South Australia. So no more grandstanding. Get back to the table and make sure that we can actually have practical outcomes for the people of South Australia. It worries me that uh, David Littleproud, who's now the Water Minister and who was a backbencher when this debate came up at the end of 2016, got up in the Parliament and accused me of being a terrorist. 
uh, a water terrorist, I think, for, uh, for saying that we need to get that extra 450 gigalitres. It was hard fought. Um, my concern is that there is significant evidence of rorting. Uh, when Rex Patrick was working with me when I was still a senator, he went up to uh, the border of New South Wales and Queensland and Lakeline eventually did a long investigative piece because there was, uh, there was extraordinary evidence of water theft uh, and uh, playing with water metres and some local farmers being deprived uh, of water up there, but it showed a ro massive rorting of the scheme. Of course, the State Royal Commission is a good thing, but ultimately we need a Federal Royal Commission with the cooperation of the state. Somehow I don't think uh, New South Wales in particular will cooperate with that, but I think that there are ways that ultimately that's what we need, because my fear is, and the Premier might be able to correct me on this, is that I can't see New South Wales ministers fronting up to a Royal Commission because they don't have to, they can't be compelled. Um, this is a critical issue uh, because when the next drought comes, and I hope it won't be for a very long time, but when the next drought comes, we'll be particularly vulnerable unless we can get that balance right. It concerns me that when I was in the Riverland uh, just a few, beginning of last week, that um, uh, a number of locals told me that they were, a, a lot of pipe was going into, uh, uh, pipes were being uh, freighted into uh, New South Wales for new water irrigation projects and I, I, I still can't see the sense of massive cotton and rice uh, in the context of, of a long-term water plant. I understand seasonal crop, crops, they're not long-term uh, 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 crops, but there is something seriously wrong, and I hope that Brett Walker, uh, 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 SCQC, who is a, an eminent lawyer, work very well respected, uh, does at least keep the issue going, and that ultimately we need to bring those in New South Wales and Queensland to account through a through a federal process. I, th I think of all the issues that we're going to talk about today, if there is one that should have everyone on the same page who purports to represent South Australia, then this is it. Um, we all saw Four Corners. Uh, we know what's happening. Uh, Jay's right, we have to fight, we have to make a noise. And I guess, Stephen, not scuttling the plan doesn't mean laying back and thinking of England. You know, we, we can... <laughs> We can engage these other... I British citizens still watch <laughs> I mean, we, we can engage the other states. We must engage the other states because really the issue is holding them to their commitments. And again, I'll acknowledge the work that uh, my colleagues in the Senate did last week. That was a most important uh, debate and a vote that Sarah Hansen Young led. The amounts, of mon the amounts of water might not have been that big, but geez, it was symbolic in terms of South Australia telling upstream, we're not gonna take this, you guys stick by your agreement. Um, we've done the right thing in terms of efficient irrigation over many, many years, and we're not gonna sacrifice our natural environment for upstream greed. Thank you. We might squeeze in one last question and perhaps we might just get a yes or no answer on this and then I'll give you two minutes to respond. So the Simpson is one of the most iconic desert ecosystems in the world and the Simpson Desert Regional Reserve is yet to have its high value wilderness areas prote protected. Will you commit to protecting the internationally significant Calicoopa Creek area within the Simpson Desert Regional Reserve via a proclamation under the Wilderness Protection Act of 1992? I can't yet, no. From our perspective, we have held this position in the past in the lead up to the 2010 election. We're out consulting on this issue uh, and we hope to have an answer before the election. Um, I, Do you know where not it is? Not yet. Yeah, I know where it is. Oh, I know okay. it since, thank you, Steve. <laughs> always sledging, always a sledge at everything, at, at every uh, forum. Um, I think we need to have a proper process. I know the significance of it and uh, uh, obviously, some level of protection has, has its environmental significance can't be understated, but there needs to be a proper process. When I started working for the environment in 1989, it was with the Wilderness Society, and our campaign was to get a Wilderness Protection Act in place. It's an excellent mechanism, and it's about time they used it for the Simpson Desert, so an emphatic yes from the Greens. Uh, can, I, can I just add something to that? that um, when we put... Uh, when the Wilderness Protection Act was put in place under a Labor government, we added some Wilderness Protection Area in the, the last days of the Bantam government, I think, and then in the whole of the period of the Liberal government, there one, wasn't one blade of grass that was added to it. And then we've put, since I've been uh, in the job, we've put almost another million square hectares, a million hectares of uh, 
land into it. So we haven't done Simpson, granted, but we've, we've done an extraordinary large number of other parks, including about 26 other dedicated parks. Okay, so now we'll ask for your sort of two minute wrap up. This has also been a random draw. Uh, Nick, you will go first, Stephen, Mark, and then Jay. So I'm going to time you again on this because we are getting running okay. very close I, I mean, to time. I think, I think this has been a very, a very good and useful discussion. Uh, this has to be a key issue. Going back to the Murray-Darling Basin, if you don't have a healthy river, you won't have a healthy economic communities because without a healthy river system, we are pretty much stuffed in terms of those irrigators in South Australia that have done the right thing for, by so, for so many years in terms of implementing water efficiency measures. Uh, I think water has to be one of the key priorities. Uh, we can't allow uh, drilling in the bight uh, based on the evidence that we've seen, and that has to be an absolute priority. Uh, in terms of the nuclear waste, uh, low level and intermediate waste repository, um, I'm not satisfied with the process or the community consent in respect of that. Uh, and I think we can actually push the issue of waste management because my concern is that with respect to waste management, um, they're, they're, that money should be going back uh, into some positive environmental benefits, not just simply going to general revenue. And, and also on the issue uh, of, of dealing um, uh, with uh, climate change, uh, the, I think we should stay tuned that the, um, the solar thermal plant at Port Augusta, I think, will be a game changer because it's dispatchable renewable energy. And I like to think we can have more of those plants here in South Australia uh, because that will add to more competition in the marketplace. It will be good for the energy market uh, and unambiguously it will secure uh, energy reliability for the state. And these are good things and it fulfills uh, very key environmental goals. Thank you. Stephen? We have an election in 25 days time. I think it's the most important election in the state's history. I think what you've heard this morning is that all four uh, of the parties that are represented up here today want to uh, make sure that our environment is protected uh, and want to uh, make sure that our environment is enhanced in South Australia. But the people of South Australia are being asked to make a question, who is going to form the government which is going to do that task best? Now, Mark's already offered that uh, he doesn't plan to form a government at this election. He's going to leave that till 2022 or 2026. Uh, so there are three parties up here. Now, I might not agree with everything that Jay says. In fact, sometimes not much at all. Uh, but the reality is he at least has policies. Uh, what we've heard today from Nick Xenophon is real, uh, really a lot of anecdotes. Uh, you know, he, he's well read. Uh, and so on nearly every single topic, he's got a sort of a buffer or a stopper or something that he can talk about which really gets away from the fact that SABS has no policies whatsoever to enhance uh, the environment here in South Australia. By contrast, we've got an excellent shadow minister who I hope is the cabinet minister uh, here in South Australia, David Spears, who has a genuine interest uh, in our environment in South Australia. He's consulted widely and our approach will be a practical approach led by a genuine person who wants to go out and engage the people of South Australia to deliver better environmental outcomes. Not more centralisation, bureaucratisation, uh, flying uh, kites around nuclear waste repositories, but practical solutions to protect and enhance our environment in South Australia in partnership with the people of this state. Thank you, Stephen. <coughs> Mark. Um, Clearly, most of the attention in this election campaign has been on who's going to form government, you know, who's going to win what seat, who will fill the Treasury uh, benches. But two things I'd remind you of. The first thing is, you all understand the preferential system of voting. The real action is who you put in last and second last. If, if environmental issues are important to you, you do get a double value vote by putting the Greens first, then you decide after that. Second message. All legislation must go through both Houses of Parliament. Do not forget the importance of the Upper House. Uh, my colleague uh, Tammy Franks is our lead candidate this election, and I can tell you that uh, the number of issues that get decided by just one vote uh, in the Upper House are, are very many, and uh, we need to make sure we keep those checks and balances. The Upper House is where inquiries are conducted, we hold the government to account, um, and sure, they nick our policies, you know, but the sincerest form of flattery, you know, taking your stuff. I announced the virtual solar plant a couple of days before and I asked a journalist, well, why didn't you pick up on when we announced it? 
you didn't have Elon Musk. <laughs> well, <laughs> fair, fair enough, maybe. Um, so be very careful about how you cast your vote in both Houses of Parliament. And uh, my commitment to you on behalf of the Greens is that all of these issues we've been talking about today, they're front and foremost in my thinking, and we're going to advance them back in Parliament after the election. South Australians are proud of their leadership in renewable energy. They really are. They're proud that on the international stage we walk tall. They're proud of the fact that when it's, we're talking about the world's largest lithium ion battery, the world's largest solar thermal plant, the extraordinary virtual power station, but it's happening here right in South Australia. We're not just sending a message about how we're improving the quality of our energy system and reducing energy prices and making it cleaner. We're also sending a message to the world about our ethics, about who we are as a people. And this is extraordinarily important. You know, that, that value proposition that we're projecting to the world uh, is, is worth more advertising dollars than you could ever spend. It also attracts our young people to stay here, to want to be part of these exciting industries of the future. They want to be part of this stuff. And other companies want to be here because they see a government prepared to step up and take bold action to anticipate the future. We could see that we're going to have a low carbon economy, we're going to have a constrained carbon economy in the future, and we could also see all of the best expert advice, which was that the first movers, the people that went first, would get all of the advantages. And that's what we're trying to do. Are there risks? Of course there are. Life's a risk. What's a hell of a risk is this big international experiment we're running, which is how much carbon pollution you can put in the atmosphere and see what happens to your climate. That's a risk. And we're taking action now on climate change and we're seizing the future. You did very well there. Under time. So thank you very much, Premier Weatherall, Stephen Marshall, Nick Xenophon and Mark Parnell for participating in this important event today. So as I mentioned earlier, each party's commitments to the environmental policy positions outlined in South Australia, Our Future, will be communicated in an environmental scorecard that will be finalised within the next few days. So thank you all once again for attending. Hopefully this forum has been helping, helpful in um, your decision-making process. If you're not on one of the subscriber lists already and would like to get the results, you can sign up on the way out. There's some sign-up sheets. And many of the groups are organising activities that you can be involved in too over the next few weeks. So thank you all for your att attendance. Thank you all once again, gentlemen, and uh, all the best for South Australia. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.